about pipelines and property rights and regulatory issues related to that. Um, you know, the, the last decade or so has seen uh, an, an amazing transformation of the energy sector with the fall of natural gas prices. It's had enormous implications for uh, electric, uh, electricity and other sectors. Uh, along with that, though, has come a uh, increased focus on a number of different issues, particularly related to the transportation of energy for natural gas uh, through pipelines and pipeline construction. Uh, it's raised a host of issues, uh, environmental, but regulatory, legal, involving property rights and other issues. So today, we assemble the distinguished panel to discuss uh, directly to my left is uh, William Murray, who is a uh, energy policy manager at R Street. Um, so William has a, a background in energy journalism. Uh, he was a former editor of the Real Clear Energy uh, website. Uh, also worked for uh, part of that for Bloomberg, um, uh, covering energy issues uh, as well as uh, a variety of other Next, uh, we have Donald Santa, who is the President CEO of the Interstate National Gas Association of America, uh, I-N-G-A-A, -A. for short. Yeah, Inga, for short. Uh, uh, in uh, his, his past life, uh, Mr. Santa uh, was a member of FERC uh, and was the majority counsel for the U.S. Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. Uh, and then at the uh, end of the panel, we have uh, Megan Gibson. Uh, Gibson is a attorney uh, with the Niskanen Center and heads up their natural gas pipeline litigation program. Uh, and uh, prior to joining Niskanen, uh, Ms. Gibson was in private practice and was on the uh, Washington, D.C. Super Lawyers Rising Star list. So, uh, first of all, everyone, if you could just welcome the, the panelists. So, uh, I think the, the order that we've agreed to is uh, Mr. Sandy, you go first, and then uh, Ms. Gibson, and then Mr. Murray will finish so, up. So, then we'll turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Josiah, and thanks to R Street for the opportunity to be with you this afternoon and to talk about this topic of uh, the development of our energy infrastructure to take care of, take advantage of America's energy abundance uh, and eminent domain and, and landowner issues that are part of it. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the natural gas industry and with uh, Inga, let me, let me kind of set the stage a bit. Uh, Inga represents the owners and operators of large diameter uh, interstate natural gas pipelines. So these are the pipelines that uh, take delivery of gas after it's been produced and processed, transported downstream, typically, typically across multiple states, and then deliver that natural gas to local gas utilities, for example, Washington Gas Light, Baltimore Gas and Electric, or directly to large volume users such as uh, industrial users or electric generators. Uh, the network of interstate pipelines in the United States touches every one of the contiguous 48 states. So every single state is touched by the interstate natural gas pipeline. Let me also give you two analogies to think about the system. Uh, in some ways, this is like the interstate highway system for natural gas. It is literally the these are the arteries that make it possible for us to have a national market in natural gas. And also, in some ways, what our member companies do is they are kind of akin to being kind of like the FedEx or the, the UPS of the energy delivery business. And in that interstate gas pipelines don't buy and resell gas Rather, they transport gas on behalf of the entities that are the buyers and sellers of natural gas. Uh, before getting on to talking about eminent domain and um, landowner issues, let me just touch briefly upon a related topic, and that is pipeline safety, because this is a, a very topical um, subject this year. Our regulator at the Department of Transportation, uh, known as PHMSA, Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration, just came out with their natural gas transmission rule. Uh, this rule is literally a decade in the making. 
It's the product of a collaborative process that has involved lots of stakeholders, including pipeline safety advocates in the industry. The rule is widely supported. It uh, embraces the use of new technology and engineering practices in pipeline safety, and really is the most significant update to the pipeline safety rules in, in almost five decades. Also, this is a year where pipeline safety, the Pipeline Safety Act is up for reauthorization. Uh, historically, Pipeline Safety Act reauthorization has been bipartisan. We hope that it continues to be so. We think this is a great opportunity for Congress to build on what PHMSA did in their rulemaking and also to embrace the notion of using new technology and engineering practices to advance pipeline safety and also to give PHMSA the resources that they need to, to do the job in terms of uh, inspectors and engineers. Well, what's the relation of this to what we're talking about today with landowner rights? It's an important part of what pipeline companies ensure landowners when they build pipelines that are going to be across their land, that we have got this commitment to pipeline safety. But then I talk about eminent domain and provide a bit of historical context. Um, the Natural Gas Act was enacted in 1938. Eminent domain was not part of the original law. However, in 1947, Congress amended the Gas Act to include federal eminent domain for pipeline companies who have a FERC certificate of public convenience and necessity. In other words, a project that FERC has found there to be a public need for. And if you look at the legislative history of that 1947 amendment, a lot of it is still very relevant today. Pipelines were being blocked <coughs> by opponents who had agendas whether it was competing fuels and their champions, whether it was state governments, whether it was landowners. As a result of that, there actually were gas shortages during the winter of 1946 and 1947. As a matter of fact, there were about 50,000 workers who were laid off because of gas shortages as a result of the inability to expand the pipeline system. Another thing that came up in that legislative history, if you look at it, were there complaints that because of the inability to build pipes, Lots of gas was getting wasted in the field and was getting flared. And so the waste of that resource kind of sounds familiar to some things we're dealing with today. And the Senate report on that noted that without eminent domain, it would nullify the will of Congress if a state could frustrate a pipeline with a federal determination of need. Another thing about natural gas pipelines and eminent domain and the need for it, I think that is important is that these transmission pipelines are really the only economic way to transport natural gas for long distances over land. Think about this in contrast, for example, to moving oil or refined product where you've got other modes of transportation. You can put it in a rail car, you can put it on a bar, you can put it in a truck. Given the nature of natural gas, you don't have those intermodal options to move large volumes of natural gas. So it's another reason why the federal eminent domain is so essential to achieving Congress's goals of the Natural Gas Act. And clearly there has been a lot of consumer and economic benefit to our country as a result of this. If you think about the post-World War II build-out of interstate pipelines, that was kind of at the same time as that 1947 amendment, between 1948 and 1960, the amount of gas consumed in the U.S. jumped more than two and a half times. Fast forward to when Congress did well had deep control in the late 70s and then completed that in, in the late 1980s. It was the ability to interconnect the, the formerly segregated inter and intrastate systems and expand the network that made it possible to achieve the national market we've got for gas. And then of course, let's look at the present, the past decade with the shale revolution. The fact that we now have this abundance of gas in areas where at least in recent history it was not being produced much the need to have to, to build the pipes to tie that into the market to enable consumers and the economy to benefit from that. And it clearly is that a benefit. I mean, I've seen one estimate that says if you look at disposable income as a result of the shale revolution, every single household in the United States has on average about $1,300 more per year in disposable income. So there really has been a benefit for, from this. And then finally, let me contrast it with electricity. Under the Federal Power Act, which is the companion statute to the Natural Gas Act, there is no federal eminent domain. And as a result, developing electric transmission is very, very time consuming, very, very inefficient. Uh, it frustrates our ability to build out the grid. And how much do you hear about that these days in terms of accomplishing public policy goals? 
Let me give you an example. Uh, in 2016, the state of Massachusetts enacted a law that required the states to procure more renewable energy. One of the utilities in Massachusetts went out and contracted for hydropower from Quebec. It required building a transmission line that would have gone across the state of New Hampshire. New Hampshire, notwithstanding numerous concessions, denied the approval of that transmission line. It was eventually approved to go through Maine, but still think about all of the time and effort and wasted resources, and that was just to build a line that went across one intervening state. Think about renewables and some of them, how distant they are from the load centers, the need to build transmission across multiple states. Uh, let me now talk, shift gears, and talk about landowners. Uh, you know, for the pipeline industry, relations with landowners are very, very important. Because this is not a relationship that is just during that time that the pipe is constructed. The pipe is going to be there for decades. Well, pipeline companies need to have good relations with landowners because they're going to need access to that property for inspections, for maintenance, all the things that they need to do. As a result of that, um, Inga several years ago adopted a set of commitments to landowners. As a matter of fact, we've got copies of it. I think they're around the table in the back of the room, so I encourage you to pick it up on the way out. And I'm not going to read through the entire thing, but let me give you four examples from those commitments. One of them is to provide accurate and timely information to landowners who are developing pipes. Another one is to negotiate in good faith with them. Another is to respond in timely fashion when they, when they need information. And then finally, on eminent domain, which is the, the topic we're here on today, let me read you the commitment there. It says, we begin every easement negotiation with the expectation that a mutual agreement could be reached and eminent domain rights will not need to be exercised. <coughs> Further, we will be clear in communicating that federal eminent domain will not be exercised unless FERC grants a certificate. Eminent domain will only be exercised as a means of last resort. And we in fact really mean that because we did a survey in connection with some comments we filed at FERC uh, last year. And we surveyed 18 of our member companies about projects they had done in the 10 years from 2008 to 2018, so roughly the terminus with the shale revolution. And what we found was that for less than 2% of the tracts needed to construct the pipelines, less than 2% of them were required after a judicial determination. In other words, after you had exercised eminent domain and there had been a court decision. So very clearly, this is exercised as a last resort. At INGO, we don't represent all of the owners and operators of their state natural gas pipelines. However, roughly looking at the mileage of our member companies, I can say we represent about 90% of the interstate pipeline mileage. So I think those commitments do represent really a, a big, big part of our industry. Let me finally talk about the fact that I think landowner relations can be improved. There's no doubt about it. Uh, as some of you know, the, the FERC uh, last year had a notice of inquiry on the FERC certificate process. It addressed lots and lots of topics, but one part of it was addressing uh, landowner relations. And we included a number of suggestions in our comments on improving that process, that landowners ought to have uh, greater and improved access to information, uh, that FERC should stress the importance of survey access to complete environmental reviews, and importantly, that FERC should improve its own explanations of landowner rights and eminent domain and the material that it shares with landowners. And FERC has taken some action in this regard. Some of you may know that uh, within the past month, Chairman Chatterjee at FERC announced that he was going to instruct staff to process landowner issues in the hearing requests within 30 days. Why is that important? Because under the Natural Gas Act, you can't get to court challenging a FERC action unless FERC has acted on rehearing. And so I think what the Chairman is committed to will ensure that landowners have the ability to get to get to court reasonably promptly. Well, let me quickly conclude. Uh, first of all, I want to impress upon you uh, Inga's commitment to uh, landowner relations and the pipeline safety. Uh, second, I want to make the point that while it is not exercised frequently, uh, the eminent domain right uh, given under the Natural Gas Act is very, very essential to the ability to construct this critical energy infrastructure. And with that, uh, thank you for your attention and look forward to uh, our discussion. Thank you. My name is Megan Gaines. I'm the attorney with the Ms. Cannon Center. I manage our pipeline limitation dockets. As you can see, I'm not David. He's sorry he couldn't make it here today. Uh, 
Thank you to our street for hosting this very important conversation. So I'm here to offer a bit of a different perspective from the landowner's perspective. And I agree with the majority of the things that Mr. Santa just laid out, including that landowners do desperately need more access to information from the pipeline companies, as well as from FERC. Currently, the way the process is structured, it's really stacked against the landowners from beginning to end. Uh, beginning with notice, notice that this process is ongoing and that there is a company out there that wants to take their land to build their proposed project. Currently, under the regs, FERC delegates the <coughs> providing notice of the process to the pipeline companies. So the pipeline companies are tasked with putting the landowners whose land they want to take with notice of this is your these are your rights, this is how you assert your rights, and if you don't do X, Y, and Z, you will waive your rights and we can take your land without you being able to challenge us doing so. Um, I've reviewed numerous notices of applications, uh, cover letters that have gone out to landowners from pipeline companies, and oftentimes it gives conflicting and very confusing information on the importance, one, of intervention. If landowners do not intervene in the FERC process, in the administrative process, they waive their right to judicial review, as well as an additional administrative that's not clearly outlined anywhere uh, in any of the materials that I've reviewed. Uh, there is an implication that you can appear at hearings, you can file briefs, but a lot of landowners, including well-educated landowners, I have a client who is a physician, his wife is a licensed psychiatrist, they walked away from the two, over the 200 documents that they received from the pipeline company thinking, oh, well if I file comments with FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, I will assert my rights and I can later on you know, challenge the pipeline's certificate and their ability to take my land. Unfortunately, that's not the case. They didn't intervene, arguably they waived the right to judicial review. This is easily remedied. We're, we're hoping that FERC will be open to outlining some very simple instructions that they can provide to landowners. It can be as simple as one page, one, two, three, this is how you intervene electronically, this is how you intervene with your paper, and if you do not intervene, that's it. You're waiving your rights. So that's, that's point one. Uh, the second point I wanted to make, Mr. Santa touched on briefly, and we were very pleased to hear the Chairman's announcement about tolling orders, because it's a very serious issue that, again, delays landowners' access to the judicial system. Because what happens is, Assuming a landowner has intervened and understood the importance of intervention, they are involved in the administrative process, and assuming that FERC grants a certificate, which they do 99% of the time, grants a certificate, which gives the pipeline company the authority to start filing condemnation actions, the authority to start taking people's land. Well, what does the landowner do at that point? At that point, they have to file a request for rehearing before the administrative body, exhaust their administrative remedies before they can go to court. And what the tolling order does, and I'll explain what that is in just a minute, it delays their ability to go to court indefinitely, sometimes over 18 months. Meanwhile, the pipeline company is following condemnation actions, and as soon as they get granted an easement across the land, they start construction, and they permanently alter the land and the landowner, meanwhile, is in legal and administrative limbo and is unable to, to challenge the certificate. Uh, so we're really excited and hoping that FERC will implement uh, the 30-day lingo, which is written into the statute currently. Currently, FERC has 30 days to weigh in on the, on the hearing request, but the tolling order says, well, we need a bit more time. We're just going to sit on this for a bit. Um, the third issue, which is, is a pretty uh, significant issue, is, is what we refer to as conditional certificates. So a lot of these certificates that grant the authority of eminent domain at the end have a long list of certificates that the pipeline has to meet before it can 
construct the pipeline before it can complete the project, including obtaining all mandatory federal and state permits, <coughs> you know, the state water 401 permit being a biggie and a big obstacle sometimes for pipeline companies. But what happens with this, the nightmare scenario, and it's occurred to landowners, is the certificate is granted, the conditions are laid out, something happens, a federal court intervenes, there's a challenge, a, uh, a permit is vacated or suspended, and a permit that without that permit, the pipeline company cannot move forward with construction, they cannot complete the construction. Meanwhile, the pipeline company is condemned to the property owner's land, started construction, dug a trench, cut down all the trees, has the pipe on the ground, destroyed the land, and the pipeline is never built. And that happened to a family in Pennsylvania, the Hollerins. Uh, they had a maple tree farm. The Constitution pipeline came through, went to court for the condemnation proceedings, said we're gonna lose 80 to 100 thousand dollars a day if we don't have access to this family's land. We need it now, Judge. Judge granted it, they came through, they cut down the 500 old growth trees, we don't know how many saplings, left the stumps, left the trees on the ground for the family to deal with. That was six years ago. They haven't gotten a dime, and the pipeline isn't being built because New York denied the water quality certificate, which is currently being challenged in the courts. But meanwhile, the Hollerites are left with destroyed land and no compensation. So that's the nightmare scenario of a conditional certificate, which, again, we're hoping FERC can remedy or perhaps a, an amendment to the Natural Gas Act <laughs> could <laughs> adjust. Uh, the, the last point that I want to touch on is uh, is FERC equating, and this is to be becoming more and more of an issue, especially with the glut of natural gas in the United States now, and our desire to export a lot of it for a variety of reasons, national security reasons, et cetera. But what's happening is you're building pipelines to LNG export facilities that are 100% export. None of the gas is being used domestically. There are no domestic offshoots. And for a federal authority to be granting a private company the extraordinary authority of being able to take a private landowner's land for profit for ex solely for export, arguably that's not a public use under the new process clause. And a prime example is the city of Oberlin case. I'm not sure how many lawyers there are in the house, but the, the DC circuit just remanded that case back to FERC asking them to clarify, well, what is your reasoning behind granting this pipeline, the authority of eminent domain, granting the certificate, when a good percentage of it is going over to Canada. It's not being used domestically. And that's gonna become more and more relevant as we see more and more pipelines that are being built solely for foreign export. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for everybody showing up here. Uh, this, is a, this is timely for a number of reasons that we can get into, but uh, I mean, the title of, uh, of this event, uh, Pipelines and Property Rights, are they in conflict? I mean, the short answer is they can be. And uh, they probably shouldn't be, but the reality is more complicated than that, because it is a think tank, so we have a fairly nuanced approach. But eminent domain itself is the 600 year old habit started in England and then uh, growing out from there, or other places of the government being able to take uh, private property for the public good. Uh, the lawyers on the panel, all three of them, can correct me if I did some of these things wrong. But the, um, the increased use of, uh, of the, the issue has become much more of an issue in the last 15 years. The Supreme Court back in 2005, um, a decision Kellogg versus uh, New London, I believe, which expanded uh, the interpretation of, of eminent domain. In this case, allowing a government to decide uh, to take one piece of property from one landowner and actually give it to another landowner for uh, purposes. Um, kind of complicated, uh, controversial case. It was a 5-4 decision by a motley crew of judges uh, led by uh, Justice Kennedy and Stevens. Um, and it's kind of been a bit of an orphan. Uh, people, a lot of states have taken it to uh, task and, and uh, constrained their own views of uh, statewide uh, in the domain. And it's kind of not dissimilar to another 5-4 decision, in my mind at least, that's kind of a bit of an orphan out there. 2007 uh, Massachusetts versus the gay decision, which 
is the decision that uh, basically mandated that the EPA had to make a decision on whether uh, emissions were um, endangered. And so much of the climate debate in the last 10 years has been off of that. And that was another 5-4 decision that uh, invented some kind of original views on standing uh, in terms of state uh, special standing for issues. And um, so the rule, I guess, here, and we're talking about it a bit, what, what needs to be done, uh, three rules that, that Austin kind of says. One, try to do no net harm. It's, it's not a medical issue, it's actually an economic issue. And net harm can be tough to <coughs> um, negotiate in good faith. And the third would be the Commerce Clause is still important. Um, the Supreme Court is going to take up the Atlantic Coast uh, pipeline issue next year, probably make it a decision in June. It's a very interesting issue, not necessarily private property, but definitely jurisdictional issues. Uh, and as uh, David Bookbinder is not here to defend himself, they can do it adequately. <laughs> but uh, he said in one of his posts recently uh, about the stand and some of their successes with uh, this, this issue that there's a frenzy of uh, natural gas pipeline activity going on around the country. A frenzy. I'm not sure it's a frenzy. It's been a huge build out in the last 10 or 15 years, thanks largely to the fracking revolution. And it's finally re 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 reaching the East Coast, reaching the populated areas of the country with the highest percentage of lawyers, not, uh, not, uh, not for no reason. So, the, so you're going to have these issues come up, and I guess the no, the no harm or no net harm is a hard, is, a, is kind of hard to do because obviously you have property owners who feel their rights are being violated. At the same time, you're trying to balance fairness with just compensation and public good. Uh, the Atlantic Coast, uh, the builders of that pipeline, that would go over the Appalachians uh, into Virginia and North Carolina. They believe that there'll be fuel savings over the course of each year, about $377 million. And that's only for two states, uh, North Carolina and Virginia. Same could be said in terms of climate uh, issues in, say, New Jersey and the, in the New York area, uh, National Grid, which does a lot of electricity issues in the outer boroughs in New Jersey, uh, found that uh, uh, there was more natural gas moving into that area than displace heating oil, which is still part of the incumbent heating uh, for a lot of the housing stock there. You could, over a short period of time, lower emissions, carbon emissions in the region by, from company caused by heating oil by 37%. You could cut uh, particulate matter, which is such a huge health concern, by 12%. You could um, cut uh, smog and uh, nitrogen oxide emissions by 50%. So these are real benefits but there's a classic problem of, uh, of a concentrated cost versus a, a less concentrated benefit to the public good. Uh, negotiating faith, the negotiating good faith is also an issue because, um, you know, the economic, it's hard to price economic uh, values, or excuse me, environmental values. And as you get to the East Coast and populated areas, these values are, get higher. There's one example of Again, not a private property issue, but it's actually a state-to-state -state issue. Pipeline moving, wanting to move from Maryland, actually across Maryland, from Pennsylvania to West Virginia. Uh, needed an easement under the Potomac River. There's 12 pipelines under the Potomac right now. Um, they needed like a tenth of an acre. Uh, and they offered $5,000 uh, to the state of Maryland, uh, perhaps for other reasons. Uh, Maryland decided not to take it, and that's been stopped. I'm not sure that $5,000 is a proper offer for permanent access and easement for uh, 30 or 40 years and hundreds of million do millions of dollars over time of natural gas. So it, there should be more ability for, and a lot of this is, is not in the public domain, you know, this is private contracts, but there, there probably needs to be more <coughs> premiums, accepted premiums by the industry on the environmental uh, higher prices uh, can make uh, property owners whole, and, but as Don was saying, it's, it's actually a small percentage of property owners that actually do have serious issues with uh, the offer and with the construction. Um, and uh, and Megan, the, the, the interesting uh, bureaucratic issues that a lot of these property owners would suffer under is, is another issue that it sounds like could be solved uh, with legislation. Um, third point, I guess, is that the Commerce Clause is important. It's in the Constitution. Um, it's not necessarily 
deals with interstate commerce. In a perfect world, uh, Maryland would not be able to stop Pennsylvania gas from getting to West Virginia, or New Jersey would not be able to stop Pennsylvania gas from getting to New England. Uh, but it's not a perfect world. Um, and there is some kind of externality that they have to suffer from if they're going to not really see much benefit. So there, there's a lot of room to, to, to negotiate here and see some improvements. But it's kind of the classic battle, maybe in reverse. I mean, here on the Hill, we see the classic battle of you know, special interests fighting for access to the public parties. Um, it's the concentrated benefits of special interests at the expense of, of dispersed costs for the country. And now what eminent domain has been trying to do, and it does do fairly well, is kind of the reverse. It is uh, the dispersed benefits, you know, the concentrated costs of the law, law owner or landowner versus the dispersed benefits to the larger society. So in almost all cases that we're talking about, the dispersed benefits to the larger society in climate in energy costs are larger than the cost to the private uh, property owner. But if you're not being properly reimbursed for the cost of your property that you own, it's definitely not going to feel that way. And so I think just what we're seeing is the cost of environmental consciousness in the last half century um, suggests that there's probably a higher premium for access that is currently appreciated uh, as uh, a lot of these pipelines start to move. Uh, so we saved lots of time for questions from the audience. Before we get to that, though, I do have one question that I'd like to pose. This is an issue that was kind of alluded to uh, by several of the panelists, and that has to do with the, the public versus private issue. So, you know, image domain is always a very controversial subject, um, but traditionally, uh, when you government is building a road uh, or some other part of infrastructure, it's the government that's executing the eminent domain power for uh, infrastructure that's going to be owned and operated by the government. And when you uh, pipelines is one area where that is uh, not the case, where some of that authority is transferred over to a, uh, a private entity, assuming that they uh, their infrastructure is going to serve the, the public good. So uh, the, the question I have with Mr. Sand and the other panelists is, now how does that complicate these issues when you have uh, not only the inherently controversial issues of the domain, but then taking it uh, from a government to a more of a private entity and uh, taking point on it? Sure. I, I think there, you know, there are, it's long been accepted that uh, for public utility type functions, you know, think about your local electric utility, local gas utility, water utility, whatever, where there is a public benefit from the construction of the infrastructure and that eminent domain is necessary to secure the property for it, that that's a legitimate function. You know, for example, uh, the, the Kello decision was mentioned. And, you know, others may be more expert on it than me, but in looking at it, you know, not only the five in the majority, but three of the four dissenters recognized that a taking to satisfy a public utility type benefit was proper kind of fell outside of the category of what happened in Kello where it was transferring from one private landowner to another for a purely private use. Another thing to remember here is that, you know, not only for the, the you know, local utilities, but also for the interstate pipelines, part of the bargain here is pretty pervasive regulation. I mean, number one, the first thing is FERC has got to make a finding that the proposed project is in the public convenience and necessity. Second of all, the pipeline is accepting regulation. Pipelines rates are regulated. You can't choose what, what it's going to charge for that. It's subject to regulation. Pipeline has got to provide non-discriminatory open access to that facility. It can't control the access for its benefit. Pipeline, for that matter, even if several years down the road it wants to take the facility out of service, needs to get approval from FERC, which is what is called abandonment. So there is a trade-off there that, that in return for getting the FERC certificate, in return for getting the eminent domain that comes with it under the Natural Gas Act, you're accepting a, you know, a fairly heavy regulatory burden uh, that, that you know, doesn't attach to others who are doing business out in the economy, other investor-owned companies. 
I mean, finally, I think, you know, and getting to the interstate commerce point, I mean, that I think was what Congress recognized in 1947 when it added the eminent domain to the Natural Gas Act. The recognition was that given the nature of natural gas and where it was located, given if you wanted the entire country to benefit from it, you needed interstate facilities. And that there were going to be certain interests who, whether it was competing fuels, whether it was states who didn't think they got a benefit in the middle, landowners could stand in the way of achieving that congressional purpose. And so that was the reason why the eminent domain was created under the Natural Gas Act. But I think it's got, you know, a sound legal basis. I think that there clearly is a, 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 a strong policy basis for it. And again, there's a pretty, you know, pretty pervasive regulatory burden that attaches to somebody who is an interstate gas pipeline and gets that, that, uh, that delegated right. Uh, the panel is fine. Yes, um, I just want to address the elephant in the room that all natural gas pipelines, new natural gas pipelines that are approved by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to receive a certificate of public necessity, they are guaranteed a 14% return on equity, period, regardless of other economic conditions. And this is something I know that FERC is looking at. They issued a notice of inquiry back in March, I believe, and there are a lot of comments in there. But that is something that needs to be addressed. Um, I'll also say that with regards to public benefit, and the findings of public benefit, this ties back into what I was discussing earlier, conditional certificates. You can't find a public benefit in a pipeline that's never going to be built, yet they're still permitted to condemn land and take people's property away and destroy it in the interim while their challenges, various challenges, are working their way through the courts. And, and that is something also significant that needs to be addressed. And I just wanted to address one other comment that was made um, that a, a small percentage of landowners contest these actions. I think that also goes back to the fact that a lot of landowners don't understand their rights because we're not informed of them. Okay. All right, so now is the most exciting part of any program, which is we get to hear from the audience. So uh, if anyone has any questions, I don't think we have a microphone, an audience microphone. The acoustics in here. But that's right, yeah. If necessary, I can just keep fighting. So, who has questions? You, ma'am. Um, hi, Maya Weber with SP Global Plats. This is a, a question for Don. Stand up. Oh, okay, sure. Um, question for, for Don. I'm just wondering if you can address this idea that, that perhaps there should be more of a premium on um, the compensation given some of the increased attention to environmental concerns and how those may be paid. Yeah, sure. No, thanks for the thanks for the question, Maya. Um, two points in response. I mean, number one is that um, under the Gas Act, the law that's applied in terms of determining what is the value on eminent domain is the law of the state where the pipeline is located. So if it does get litigated, it's going to be under state law. And to the extent that state law assigns a value to that, it will be recognized. But more importantly than that is the fact that, you know, as I said for the pipeline company, exercising eminent domain and taking it to the point of it being fully litigated is a last resort. It's time consuming. It's expensive. It pits the pipeline company against the landowner who it's going to be dealing with for years and years and years. And so, you know, there are a lot of instances where a pipeline company will agree to pay in excess of what it can be calculated you would get if you litigated in order to be able to proceed with construction of the pipeline in order to preserve the relationship with the landowner. And so I think that, uh, you know, while I don't have examples to point to, I think that there are lots of instances where this is the result of a negotiation where pipelines, in fact, pay a premium above that which uh, they would get if they got fully litigated. I think there was another <coughs> question in the back. Uh, kind of similar. You had mentioned, I think, initially that one of the reasons the like, eminent domain might help things move more efficiently, because I think you'd given the example of you know the clean energy route from Canada to Massachusetts. Yep. And then you mentioned, oh, they have to go through Maine. It took a long time, but if eminent domain is your last option, how does that really increase efficiency? Or did I misunderstand you? 
Well, my point was that, you know, it, it perhaps a broader point about the fact that, that under the, the Power Act, you don't have federal, the equivalent of the FERC Certificate Authority. And so as a result, if you're doing a, an electric line that needs to go across multiple states, you've got to deal with each and every single state and the proceedings under that state's law. And then also, as part of that will be, you know, eminent domain and dealing with, for example, can you exercise eminent domain under that state's law? Let me give you an example. Um, in many cases, in some cases now, electric transmission lines are being constructed by companies that are not utilities within those particular states because they're an independent transmission company that's building interstate transmission. There would be a question there as to whether they would even qualify for eminent domain under that particular state's law because they may not satisfy the definition of being a public utility within that state. And so my point, my point was that if you had a, um, a Federal Power Act equivalent of Section 7 of the Gas Act and, and could both get approved and site interstate electric transmission projects and then also have the federal right to them in domain, it would make the process a lot more efficient and timely. Uh, yeah. Chris Knight with Argus Media. Another question for Don. Um, so this is in relation to the tolling order uh, announcement, the Chairman. Is that something that Inga thinks is a, is a good idea that should be done? And, and secondly, um, Commissioner Glick, after that meeting was talking about how, you know, why should landowners get first in line above other people who are also of an interest, like environmentalists or other people? Do, do you think that that's a good point? Like, why should anyone have to wait 18 months to litigate a certificate? Well, you know, Inga has not taken a, a position as an entity on it, but let me kind of offer you some, some thoughts. I mean, number one, uh, you know, probably, as, as some may know, what, what the commission did was in response to a, um, a concurrence that was filed in, um, uh, was it the Defenders of the Al Allegheny case? Perhaps sounds correct. Sounds correct. Okay. In the Allegheny case in which the court upheld a certificate and, and upheld the tolling order, but nonetheless a, a concurrence was filed. Mm -hmm. And, and, commission, and Chairman Chatterjee has, you know, in the course of his being on the commission, has expressed um, <laughs> concern about the balance of, of landowner rights in, in this process. And so I think he was very much responding, you know, on point to that in, in a way to, to be responsive to um, what was in that concurrence of the points that were raised there. Um, you know, as I said, I think, you know, Inga, you know, we recognize landowners, recognize we want to have their, their rights want to have productive relations with them. And so, um, you know, what the chairman instructed the staff, I think, seems very, very reasonable. Um, you know, I think the balance in terms of what Commissioner Glick raised is the recognition that in these proceedings, the number of issues that get raised in the context of, you know, either a FERC certificate case or a rate case, there are a lot of, lot of issues there. And so, in some ways, I think it was trying to balance out being responsive to the landowner concerns that had been expressed at the same time recognizing that to do justice to the, the wide range of issues raised on rehearing, um, attempting to address all of them within 30 days probably wouldn't do justice to it. Yeah, Kayvon Hergy from the Canadian Embassy. Uh, what's the typical compensation structure here? Is it like a one-time capital payoff or is it a royalty structure that kind of is proportionate to prospective impact of the landowner? Um, the second question is, could you just speak to a little to the uh, threshold for public interest and convenience related to export projects? Okay, let me take the, the um, questions in reverse order in terms sure. of the, the export projects. Yeah. Under the Gas Act, exports are authorized under Section 3 of the Gas Act. Okay. And Section 3 of the Gas Act, when they, they did the Department of Energy Organization Act back in 77 or so, they chose to put that over within the Department of Energy because of that involves interstate commerce and they wanted it to be firmly within the executive branch. The standard under that part of the law is that it will be approved unless it's found to be not consistent with the public interest. And then also when the Gas Act was amended, I believe in 2092, 
they added a provision in there that uh, said if it's a country with, with, with which the U.S. has a free trade agreement, it will deem to be in the public interest, that no particular um, finding was required there. The question that was raised and, and the question that, that was you know, mentioned um, earlier is the one of if the certificate, the approval of the, of the infrastructure for the exports, both the, if it's an LNG project, the terminal, or if it's, for example, a cross-border project, the pipeline is at FERC, and the approval of the pipe is under Section 7. And so there's a case now where the court has remanded it to FERC for further explanation in terms of the exercise of the Section 7 authority for a project where it's predominantly exports. I think that, you know, number one, think about it in terms of the fabric of the whole statute. Section 3 was part of the statute when it was enacted in 1938. It also included the Section 7 Certificate Authority at that point in time. I think make a good argument that Congress contemplated this was part of the fabric of it, and you'd need pipelines to get gas that was either going to be imported or exported. Second of all, you've got the finding that it's in the public interest, and I think that should count in terms of thinking about public benefit that, that stems from this. With regard to your first question about the compensation, uh, it, it's a one-time payment. Um, you know, at times, Issues have been raised about, well, should it be some percentage of the value of the gas that goes to the pipe or something like that? But remember, the pipe doesn't own the gas. Mm -hmm. Under our, our structure, the pipe is purely a transporter of natural mm -hmm. gas. So the basic notion is that, that the, uh, as I said earlier, um, under Section 7H, it's based on the, the, the law of the state in which the property is located and what would be done by a court in that state to determine a fair market value for the, for the property. Does it incorporate prospective impact? No. No. Okay. If I could just offer a legal qualifier, I can't help myself. Uh, <laughs> section 3 is not the same as Section 7, so something gas that is authorized by the Department of Energy under Section 3 for export, the standard is the need to find that such export is not inconsistent with the public interest. That's very different than a finding of public need and necessity under Section 7. Section 7 comes with it, the authority of eminent domain. Section 3 does not carry that authority with it. And that's the current remand report for is that they need to justify the export under their public benefit analysis, which they did not do under the original analysis. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more about uh, the notion of the percentage of landowners who contract before eminent domain proceedings actually um, come to fore. Uh, you know, obviously, it's not an equal bargaining transaction here, you know, and even under the most ideal circumstances where the pipeline is acting completely in good faith, there's still obviously the obvious knowledge of that bully pulpit of being able to have the FERC certificate being treated as a de facto for public use. I'm wondering in terms of um, analyzing the power structure here, how many landowners do you think in, in a typical proceeding do sign a contract before eminent domain, but not because they actually agree with the pipeline, but because they feel that essentially the power and the stack is against them and that there's they don't have the funds, the time, and the resources to be able to actually go through a condemnation and a certificate appeal. I, I, I would say uh, it varies pipeline to pipeline and population to population. A lot of the populations that are affected by these pipelines are rural, heavily uneducated. There's a county, for example, in West Virginia that's being affected by the Mountain Valley pipeline. Only 25% of the population has a high school degree. So these, it's stacked against them for sure. And I think, again, the fixing the way that they put these landowners on notice and make it easy for them to intervene and assert their rights will address largely a lot of that. And hopefully not through any sort of amendment to the Natural Gas Act. I think it would be just a simple instruction from FERC and guidance issued to the pipeline companies on how to communicate with landowners initially. No, we, we agree that, you know, and, and as reflected in our comments in, in the certificate NOI proceeding, that, you know, there, are, there is room for improvement in terms of, of the commission 
and clarity of what it does and how it communicates with landowners. And um, you know, so I think that that's an area where I think probably there's agreement in terms of there's room for improvement to, to make sure that folks are as informed as possible. And I'll, I'll just add the DC Circuit has found that the fact that your land is at issue and is subject to condemnation, potential condemnation proceedings under a certificate is in itself an injury. So regardless of whether you settle, you give them an easement, or your land is taken via eminent domain, it's considered to be a huge right, uh, So just one final question. Uh, so you, Ms. Dixon, you talked about the, the nightmare scenario of the, uh, the condemnation that occurs, maybe the process starts, and then there are other, there are other approvals or challenges that can go on at another level. Obviously, whenever you're talking about some sort of uh, project, you know the more the, the more different uh, approvals you need from different levels and boxes can make the process a lot more complicated. So, is that just something that we have to live with? Is that something that needs to be looked at in terms of the number of different entities who have to sign off uh, in order for one of these projects to get to completion? Or uh, what? Do we, I'd like to hear from the, all the panelists uh, on this. I mean, I think there is, you know, room for improvement in terms of the permitting process. I think you know, there are things that have been done by this administration to try to uh, make that process more efficient. You know, for example, the, the One Federal Decision Initiative, which I think, quite frankly, just doesn't apply to pipelines. It applies to kind of infrastructure that needs federal permitting across the board uh, and, and ought to be viewed in that context. I also think, you know, the, the issue of the Section 401 of the Clean Water Act and the fact that a state has used that to effectively try to attempt to veto a pipeline project is very troublesome. You know, it's interesting if you go back to the, the language from the, the Section 7H of the 1947 amendment to the, the Gas Act that I talked about, you know, they talk about the fact that one of the things they were trying to avoid there was the fact that of an individual state using a pipeline and effectively nullifying the will of Congress and a, a federal determination made a need. And yet that, in fact, is what, you know, the state of New York has done with regard to Section 401. So I think that's something that, you know, while there are state in interests that need to be taken into account there, you know, the ability to effectively use, to, to attempt to use that as a veto, I think is very, uh, is very troubling. And if I may offer a solution as to how to avoid the nightmare scenario that was described, if a federal permit is vacated or suspended that is mandatory for the pipeline to develop, a very simple solution would be the pipeline is required to put FERC on notice within X amount of days, five to 10 days. And in the interim, while that permit is being sorted out, the certificate is suspended and they cannot move forward with any combination proceedings or construction. Well, I was just, I'm betrayed. I mean, this is, this is eminent domain, and this is a master class in eminent domain. <laughs> because it's such a, I mean, it was, it had to be invented over time. And, and, and the issue, of course, of public good versus private interest is, uh, is you know, one of the issues of democracy. But uh, there are examples that you were mentioning, the 401 case in New York, where states just simply don't, don't care and don't want neighboring state to benefit. But that uh, that really is, um, well, democratic is not very fair in the, in the con in, you know, constitutional issues. But it is possible for one landowner to refuse and to basically hold infrastructure hostage. I mean, that is ultimately the dynamic in which an eminent domain would be used. Um, I don't know the percentage of that happening. Um, but it's, uh, it is essentially an, an invention to get around what is the classic human problem of, of shared interests and private interests. It's, it's a perennial. So uh, please join me in thanking our panelists.
Hey, friends. <laughs> Thank you.